Minister of Romney gives updates on the long lease land issues. Netherlands in for a hard lockdown, almost everything closed till January the 19th. And President of the St. Martin's Lions Club gives a brief history of the club's existence. Those are the headlines from Monday, December the 14th, 2020. Greetings, everyone. This is SXM Daily News, and I'm Valerie from Pitten. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. And as usual, we have a full newscast, so let's get started. In our first story, at the 50th anniversary celebrations of the St. Martin's Lions Club on Saturday last, December the 12th, Lions Club President Alphonse Gums gave a brief history of the St. Martin's Lions Club chapter, which was formed on December the 12th, 1970. The president said that 50 years is a major milestone and he can talk for all when he says that this is a personal achievement as well. I am Lionel Alphonse Gomes and I greet you this evening in my capacity as president of the St. Martin Lions Club. Marcus Garvey said, and I quote, a people without knowledge of their past history, origin and culture it's like a tree without roots, unquote. I stand before you in this semi-virtual setting as we celebrate 50 years of Lionism in St. Martin today, December 12, 2020. Over these 50 years, the St. Martin Lions Club has continually exhibited their love, dedicated service, and commitment to those in need. 50 years is a major milestone for our club. And I'm confident and could say for every past and present member that this is a personal achievement as well. When the planning for this celebration started, the COVID-19 pandemic was nowhere to be heard of. A big festive celebration was being planned with over 200 persons expecting to be in attendance. However, COVID-19 has changed our plans. Therefore, our celebration today is not the grand festivity that was originally planned, but a solemn occasion to pause and look back at this 50-year journey. On December the 12th, 1970, this esteemed club was founded by 22 well-known businessmen in our community who saw the need for humanitarian service to our inhabitants. Today, we still have in our midst two charter members, namely life member Lion Frank Arnell, Progressive Melvin Jones Fellow, and former Lion William Barrettson, who resides in the Netherlands today. The late Ben Flan was our charter president. To date, we have seen 42 members take the oath of president, with some serving more than one term as our club president. I would like to pause for a brief moment to remember our founders, past president, and members who are not with us today, whom we know would have loved to share this symbolic occasion with us. Meanwhile, Prime Minister of St. Martin and Honorary Member of the St. Martin's Lions Club, the Honorable Sylvia Jacobs, congratulated the Lions Club on their 50th anniversary. The Prime Minister said that she is very proud to be an honorary member. It gives me great pleasure as Prime Minister of St. Martin and Honorary Lion of the St. Martin's Lions Club to wish you a very, very happy and worthy 50 years anniversary. 50 years is a half a lifetime for some people, but not even a lifetime for others. And we are blessed that we have had a Lions Club such as yours here on St. Martin giving dedicated service to the people of St. Martin. I am truly proud to be an honorary member and so sorry that we weren't able to come together um, to gather to celebrate this wonderful occasion. But know that the community of St. Martin finds it very worthy that you are in its existence, that you are doing such great service and that it can be felt tangibly. I will continue to support the Lions Club and all its endeavors and I wish that each and every dedicated lion will continue to encourage others 
to not just join in service to St. Martin, but to be good citizens for St. Martin. Happy 50th anniversary and congratulations once again. And a pre-recorded interview was done with some of the past presidents, which included Wally Havertong, Paul Marshall, Claudio Bancamper, Carmen Lake, Maxime Larmony, Frank Arnell, and the Lions' first female president, Lisandra Ellis Havertong. Don't take that 50 years, that's it. We're going to relax now. This is the time that we're going to go forward and improve this community. The way the economy, the way the world is going, the needs of our population are increasing. The way to make money is decreasing. So we have to get creative on how we can continue serving our community and doing that better. Well, as Lion, as an organization, we have to change. We have to find new ways of serving our community because like, the needs are there. There are a lot, but the needs are also changing. The needs of our people are also changing, and we need to change with that and be able to uh, adapt to the changes. It's amazing what we have been able to do without even coming to the den. Huh? It, it is, uh, and, and, and I foresee that if we want to continue to be successful, we cannot and we, we will not go back to the regular way of meeting. Yeah. And I think the structure that Lionism have is just fitting for that as well. Why? Because you're allowed to have different work groups whether you call in committees or whatever. So you could tailor to what is happening or what's going to be happening. You don't need to really be cast in a jacket, right? Besides the fact that there's a structure, there's pro protocol, right? And based on that, you would be governed. Yeah? And I think the best thing about it is that you know what governs you. If you have persons who are not community-minded, they can wear you down who want to do something for the community. And um, it's very important to ensure that whoever you invite to become a member of the club, that that person has an interest in community and not to shine as a member of the Lions because it can bring him to the next level. It has to be a community-minded person, and my interest in being a member of the Lions Club, community first. I myself don't have kids, but um, all the Leos that passed through the years, um, that gave me that sense of me having many kids. Um, and I loved it. I, I loved the drive that they give you. Um, there was always, all the 20 years, you, you see how kids are 20 years ago to what they are now, how different they are. The projects that we have done over the years. Um, but yeah, most importantly is to give them what Leo, Leonism stands for, leadership, experience, and opportunity. Those are the three key factors that all those youngsters and many of them that were Leo, they're back here. They have, they're holding huge positions. They, you know, they have um, amazing jobs. And I think it all stemmed off and started off as um, being part of the St. Martin Alpha Leo Club. And still to come, Minister of Romy gives updates on the long lease land issues. I'll have a detail to that story and much more with SXM Daily News Eternity. GEBE has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you, whether in person, over the phone, or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, 
effective and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, powering a brighter future. Our friend Mega Wadi is here with tips to save you energy. One, turn your air code temperature up. Two, use a ceiling fan instead. Three, buy energy saving products. Save some green with NVGEBE. Welcome back, viewers. You're watching SXM Daily News, and I'm Valerie von Putten. As we continue now in other news, the House of Parliament sat in a public meeting on December the 11th, 2020. The public meeting, which was adjourned on November the 20th, 2020, was reconvened on Friday last. The Minister of Public Housing, Social Planning, Environment and Infrastructure, Egbert J. Doran, was in attendance to update members of Parliament about the current long lease land issues. This meeting was requested by Member of Parliament G.S. Heiliger Martin, MP OEC Artley, and MP R. Bryson. Um, MP Arundel, no further questions. MP Emmanuel, is it in the interest of the country to fabricate criminal accusations against elected officials and or civil servants? As long as the claims of an individual is not factual, this is not in the best interest of the country. Question posed by MP Boncamper, what is the policy in place for someone who has long leased land for about 20 years and is not making use of it? Can you just sell it? The standard principle to <clears throat> is to include the clause of stipulation within the notarized deed that the regulations mention in a scenario that is from taking to regulate that this scenario does not take place. The clause says that an individual has a period of up to six months to build or to develop said parcel. Failure to do such can result in a long lease agreement being retracted. What is the policy on economical rights? There is no existing policy in place with regards to economical rights. Is the sale of economical rights taxable, yes or no? Also explain what is the position of government tax office in relation to that. The sale of economical rights is not taxable in St. Martin. Possible ways to generate income would be to include a clause in a deed which stipulates, if permissible, the canons must be immediately increased. This has been brought to the relevant ministry for further handling. This answer was given by the Cabinet of Finance. Land issued 10 to 40 years ago and still has not been used. Will the task force look into taking back the land and reissuing to persons who have asked for such? The task force is focused on collecting the outstanding canons and fees due to the current liquidity challenge that we face as a government. Moving forward into the various assignments that are to be tackled within the scope of the Department of Domain Affairs. Is there a building permit policy or a placement policy for the rise of number boots? Is there a policy for the placement of these boots? While VOMI regulates the legal placements and construction of permanent commercial boots or both public and private property, the Ministry of TIAT grants operational licenses to all the locations in question. We recognize the need for a joint policy between the two ministries. This policy can determine a suitable location where boots will be erected and or to execute their businesses, their business. Question by MP Boncamper again. Gliding skills. Where is it written that Rainforest uses 5% of the property and they must pay a gilla 20, one gilla and 20 cents per square meter? Based on research within the department, a best practice approach was used to determine if a specific case, a lower or higher canon is justifiable. Particularly in big cases, we'll get a custom approach. The ministry is establishing a policy on canon fees, which will also include the regulations to indicate this situation moving forward, to include this gliding scales moving forward. Is the gliding scale regulated in the law of policy? If not, why are we using it? I refer back to the previous answer. MP Rumu, no need. MP Otley, no need. MP Westcott Williams, what is the minister's thinking going forward with respect to the emergency housing projects? Are you at liberty to share your views going forward specifically for the persons living in these homes? What is the timeline to address this? The situation with the inhabitants of the emergency homes has my full attention in improving overall living conditions of the residents. More research is needed in order to present the residents with a solution that would meet their financial capabilities. Further collaboration in this matter will be discussed with the St. Martin Housing Development Foundation in establishing a new plan of approach moving forward in order to develop permanent homes for these residents. 
if the minister sees the need to upgrade the whole administration and policy guidelines so that everyone would like to know what type of treatment they are entitled to in, some, in the same cases. There is a need <clears throat> for establishing policy and guidelines to cover the challenges and issues that are faced within the department. As mentioned, the, the ministry, as mentioned in the previous meeting, the ministry is busy establishing such measures. So Abe was also previously commissioned to carry out the overall assessment of the functioning and operations of the department. The final assessment and recommendations will be taken into account in the general advancement of the Department of Domain Affairs. And that will be shared with Parliament once we receive such. Question posed by MP Peterson. Can the Minister of Romney make the forged documents available if he could? At present, I'm not aware of any forged documents that you are referring to. Question number two. How do you sneak in a new decision into a decree if the final signature is of the minister? All departments are con all documents are considered final with the signature of the minister of Romy. Question posed by MP Pantoflet: When issuing land on the hillside, is it to is it so that everyone gets the same size on on the same level? Is it so that the sizes can vary? Is there a policy in place for such cases? Example given. If a thousand square meters is being given, what will be given to everyone across the board and others, if others, some others receive 700 square meters? Issuing land on the hillside is done in accordance to the regulation of the hillside policy. The planning permits also, in principle, follow the guidelines of the hillside policy. The table, this table, I have a table that I um, will submit to Parliament after, where it elucidates the different sizes and the density and the different square meters and what is possible. This will be provided in writing. I move on to questions by MP Bryson. Any update on Shipyard? Has he paid? Shipyard Henry has a significant outstanding amount owed to gov the government of St. Martin. The concerns on this case has been taken up in, with, by the legal representative of government for further handling in the court, which is currently ongoing. And now in news out of The Hague, in his address to the nation on Monday evening, Prime Minister Mark Rutte will announce a far-reaching lockdown in which almost everything will be closed until the 19th of January 2021. Sources in The Hague told NOS the measures will take effect at midnight to prevent a run on shops on Tuesday. The closure affects all non-essential stores like clothing stores and garden centers, contact professions like massage parlors and physiotherapists, and schools. Schools must close their doors from Wednesday and switch to online education, according to the broadcaster sources. The government is taking these drastic measures in an attempt to reduce the still sky-high number of daily coronavirus infections. On Sunday, Jaap van Dissel of Public Health Institute uh, RIVM told the government that the current pressure on intensive care units is alarming. Last week, Rutte said that the Christmas days will be spared from tighter coronavirus restrictions. Whether this is still the case with the RIVM, reportedly nearly 10,000 new infections on Sunday remains to be seen. According to NOS sources, Rutte will urge Netherlands residents rather, to stay at home as much as possible and to not receive any guests. The setting of a curfew was discussed but decided against. The leaders of the parliamentary parties were invited to the Ministry of General Affairs, Prime Minister Mark Rutte's ministry, at noon on Monday so that they can be informed of the measures the government is now planning. This also shows how extraordinary the situation is, political reporter Zander van der Wulp said to the broadcast. ...ziek zijn geweest en nog steeds niet de ouder zijn. Omdat ze hun baan kwijt raken of een bedrijf over de kop zien gaan, bijvoorbeeld in de horeca. We zien jonge mensen die hun toekomstplannen in de wacht moeten zetten. We zien ouderen die bang zijn om ziek te worden. En we zien stress en eenzaamheid als grote en groeiende problemen door alle generaties heen. We voelen en begrijpen allemaal, juist na dit jaar is de behoefte aan samen rond de kerstboom, aan gewoon en echt menselijk contact, groter dan ooit. En daarom wil ik u allemaal vragen rond de kerst, binnen alle beperkingen, oog te blijven houden voor mensen die het zwaar hebben. 
Voor mensen die verdrietig zijn. Mensen die alleen zijn. Aandacht voor elkaar helpt ons door deze ellendige periode heen te komen. Dat we er doorheen komen staat voor mij vast. Vanwege het vaccin dat eraan komt, maar meer nog vanwege de veerkracht die we met elkaar hebben laten zien. Natuurlijk, we zijn allemaal mensen die niet perfect zijn. En we vinden het allemaal moeilijk ons 100% altijd en overal aan de regels te houden. Daar gaat het ook veel over in gesprekken tussen mensen, online en in de media, en dat snap ik. Maar wat ik ook zie is dat het overgrote deel van de Nederlanders zich heel goed realiseert dat we onszelf en elkaar moeten beschermen door ons gedrag aan te passen. Ik zie ongelooflijk veel mensen die er het beste van proberen te maken. Mensen die de moed erin houden en die andere mensen helpen de moed niet te verliezen. We maken met 17 miljoen mensen iets mee dat ongekend is. Iets dat groter is dan we ooit in vredestijd hebben meegemaakt. En toch slaan we ons er doorheen. Het is goed dat we blijven zien en het helpt ook de volgende fase aan te kunnen. Het punt is, wij moeten als mensen de hele dag door tientallen of honderden keren alert zijn om het virus op afstand te houden. Het virus hoeft maar één keer geluk te hebben om over te springen. Wij moeten bij elk contact geluk hebben. Dat is een ongelijke strijd. En dat is precies waar we nu naar kijken. Want het virus springt over. En veel te vaak. Elke dag overlijden gemiddeld 60 mensen aan corona. Elke dag noteren we gemiddeld zo'n 9000 nieuwe besmettingen. Dat is een volle kuip in minder dan zes dagen. Ook in de ziekenhuizen en verpleeghuizen stijgen de cijfers. In de tweede golf komen meer mensen in het ziekenhuis terecht dan in de eerste golf. Ik weet, getallen zijn abstract en ze vertellen ook zeker niet het hele verhaal. Maar de realiteit is dat er inmiddels meer dan een miljoen reguliere behandelingen in het ziekenhuis zijn uitgesteld. Het zou je maar overkomen als je op een behandeling zit te wachten. De realiteit is dat de mensen in de ziekenhuizen en verpleeghuizen alweer drie maanden op hun tandvlees lopen. De rek is er echt uit. En dan moet het griepseizoen nog beginnen. En de realiteit is ook dat we niet te maken hebben met een onschuldige griep... wat sommigen, bijvoorbeeld de demonstranten hier buiten nog steeds denken... maar met een virus dat iedereen hard kan raken. Dus niet alleen de alleroudste onder ons. Inmiddels hebben ongeveer 30.000 mensen met corona in het ziekenhuis gelegen... waarvan 6.000 op de intensive care... Van die 6000 was de groep jonger dan 50 jaar 2,5 keer groter dan de groep boven de 80. De harde waarheid is dat bijna al deze 6000 mensen zouden zijn overleden als ze niet op de intensive care behandeld waren. En dat ze bijna zonder uitzondering nog lang na een ontslag uit het ziekenhuis te maken hebben met kortademigheid, extreme moeheid en andere klachten. Dat is wat corona doet. Dat is waarom het zo belangrijk is dat de zorg toegankelijk blijft. Dat er een bed voor je is, als je dat nodig hebt. En dat is ook waarom ik vandaag nog een keer tegen alle werkers in de ziekenhuizen, in de verpleeghuizen, in de thuiszorg en bij de GGD's wil zeggen, dank jullie wel. Now, turning to our weather forecast for December the 14th, 2020. Moisture and weak instability associated with a multi-layered trough may cause a few showers across the local area. Meanwhile, a loose surface pressure gradient will maintain light to gentle winds. Seas will peak at 7 feet during the next few days. Small craft operators and sea bathers should exercise caution. So the outlook through Wednesday midday, partly cloudy with a few passing showers possible. Now, let's turn to your three-day forecast. And still to come, member of the SMAP wants to know what is the Prime Minister saying regarding the acceptance of the COVID liquidity support from Holland. 
I'll have a detail to that story when SXM did it. The innovative Banco Matico contactless smart card. Your Banco Matico smart card is now equipped with a contactless feature for payments. So get ready to tap and go. Contactless payments are fast, easy, secure, and accepted worldwide at all Maestro-enabled contactless terminals. Tap for transactions equivalent to or less than 100 NAV, or the U.S. dollar equivalent. You will receive notifications via email anytime you tap. Tap, tap, and pay fast, fast with WIB. For more information, visit our website at wib-bank.net. Tap and go with your partner in progress. Welcome back, viewers. And as we end this edition of SXM Daily News for this evening, speaking at the Anti-Poverty Platform's weekly press briefing, SMAP, on Thursday last, December the 10th, SMAP's member, Raymond J. Sirun, wanted to know what is the Prime Minister saying regarding the acceptance of the COVID liquidity support from Holland? Is St. Martin close to accepting the Dutch colonial reform entity and the Dutch imposed reform in the country packages? The member of SMAP elaborated further. Our Prime Minister, in the weekly press conference of yesterday, said that they are close to an agreement with the Dutch, <coughs> and that on the third tranche of COVID liquidity support conditions. What is the Prime Minister saying? Is the SMAP government close? to accept the Dutch colonial reform entity and the Dutch imposed reforms in the country packages. Accepting the conditions of the first and the second tranche was already an acceptance of workers' rights and human rights violations. These conditions were discriminatory and increased the inequality pandemic in the kingdom. So how the following conditions in the country packages of St. Martin, to name a few, increase the turnover tax from 5% to a sales tax of 12%. Dollarization. Reduce the public wage bill to 10% of GDP, which means another 30% cut in remunerations of civil servants. How this will lead to equality in social, economic, and cultural rights in the kingdom? Did the Prime Minister or any minister of the Council of Ministers address how we will realize our human rights equally in the coming governing period? Which workers' rights, which human rights will be realized on an equal footing in the kingdom in this four-year governing period? and in the coming seven years of governance with the colonial reform entity. And with that, viewers, it brings us to the end of this edition of SXM Daily News for this evening. I am Valerie Van Putten, thanking you so much for joining me this evening. And just a reminder that this and other programs are available online. Simply log on to stmartinmediacenter.com for viewing. And on behalf of the SXM Daily News team, we thank you so much for watching and plan on meeting you right back here again tomorrow.